Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution and the first of a double bill of world affairs talks uh, this week. And today it's about how safe and humane are our prisons. And uh, before I introduce uh, Joe, I just want to uh, say a few things about admin and safety and health before we get started. So in all my time at the BLSI, which is too many years, I would care to remember, uh, the fire alarm has never gone off in the evening. So it probably won't this time, but in case it does, could you please all form an orderly queue, walk down the stairs from which you came up, out of the front door, turn right, turn right again at the end of the road and assemble at Chapel Green. And then we'll take your names and make sure everybody has left the building. And that's really all for the audience in the room. As far as the online audience is concerned, uh, there are three different ways of asking questions. I would ask you all to, to refrain from asking questions during the presentation because we'll have a Q&A session afterwards. But when we get to the Q&A session, please feel free to unmute yourself and show your video and you can just raise your hand and uh, to ask a question, I'll pick you out and you'll be able to be on our big screen and ask a question directly of Joe. Alternatively, you can raise your hand electronically in Zoom and I shall pick you out and uh, you can ask yourself the question that way. And thirdly, uh, and very, very usefully, you can put your observations and questions in the, in the chat room, uh, which again, I will moderate and uh, pick up questions from there. But now to the main event. I think uh, today is, is a very important and very poignant talk. Uh, how humane and safe are our prisons? Uh, it's, it's a big topic and lots to cover, uh, but I'm delighted that we have somebody very special here, a very, our own Joe Wilson, director, director and now speaker at the, the BLSI and for his sins also chair of finance, but uh, he's got a fantastic CV, you know, he started with getting his PhD in laser, laser physics in 1982. That's, uh, and then in the last 36 years has been basically in engineering and instrumentation, uh, fulfilling general manager roles, marketing, sales roles, engineering roles. And he spent the last uh, six years of his career before retiring in 2018 in Sweden, in Gothenburg. So obviously once you've retired, you want to do something meaningful in life and continue your trajectory. And of course, he, there was no other place than joining the BLSI in 2019 and then became uh, chairman of finance and uh, a director in 2020. But obviously, the BLSI and spending all of his time every day of the week at the BLSI wasn't enough. So he decided he needed to do a master's in visual neuroscience. And then when that was completed, he still felt he wasn't completely utilizing his potential. And he's also a volunteer at the Independent Monitoring Board working in the prison in Bristol. And that's why he's here today, to give us feedback on his experiences, his personal experiences of the prison service. And I'm sure we'll touch on what's going well and what's not going quite so well and what really does need to change. So without further ado, I hand you over to Joe Wilson. All right, well, thank you, Andreas. And um, hopefully you can all hear me at the back. That's good. So uh, yes, how safe and humane are our prisons? Well, up until four years ago, uh, I had no experience of this subject whatsoever. Uh, so I started as a um, member of the IMB at Bristol, uh, as Andrea said, and uh, so I've spent, I've probably been to the prison now about a hundred times in the last three years, spoken probably to a thousand or more prisoners and uh, a couple of hundred staff. So I probably describe myself as an informed observer rather than any kind of expert. Uh, as Andreas mentioned, um, I am here as a private individual. Uh, although I'm a member of the IMB, the views I will be expressing will be mine, not those of the IMB, nor the prison service, nor anybody else. So this is 
my personal view on the topic. So um, the four main areas I'll be looking at. So to start with a very brief overview of the prison system in England and Wales. Uh, we'll then look at what the independent monitoring boards are and why they exist. Uh, and then how do we do monitoring in a prison? How do we make sure it's effective and objective and evidence-based? Uh, and then we'll finish off looking at some of the challenges facing the prison system today. So <clears throat> if you look at the prison system in England and Wales, uh, it's just over 100 prisons for adults, um, of which about 10% are for women. Uh, interestingly, again, around about 10% are actually in the private sector. So they are run by people like G4S and Serco. The, um, the usable capacity, as defined by the prison service, is about 87,000 places. Uh, currently, the prison population in England and Wales is about 86,000. So as of today, the prison service in the UK is running around about 99% of capacity, which, as you can imagine, brings challenges. And we'll come back to that later. In terms of how we compare with other countries like us, um, our prison population is about 132 per 100,000. Uh, Germany is about 71. Uh, France is like 93. So of countries like us, we tend to be on the high end for prison population, but not disastrously so, you might think. Uh, if you compare it to the US, it's about 650 per 100,000. It's extraordinary. But we are talking about England and Wales. Now, because of various changes to sentencing law, uh, the projected population will rise from 87,000 to about 94,000 in a couple of years' time, and over 100,000 a couple of years later. So how's that going to work is an obvious question, and we'll come back to that later. So in terms of the types of prisons that we have, four categories, A, B, C, and D, ranging, ranging from high security, um, for the most dangerous um, prisoners down to open prisons category D, which is for prisoners who are approaching release. And that's how they can learn to reintegrate back into society. And then there are different types. So Bristol is a reception prison, also known as a local. So it's a cat B local. Uh, and this means that it uh, is both a prison for um, prisoners who have families local to Bristol because the idea generally is that you are imprisoned next close to your family. But it's also a reception prison so that prisoners who have been uh, either sentenced or remanded from Bristol Crown Court, if uh, in both cases they will then go from the court to Bristol prison for then onward movement to another prison in the next weeks or months. So that's what Bristol is. So that's a reception prison. We have a training prison for category B and C, and that's where that's where you start to, to rehabilitate in principle in terms of education and skills training. And then the resettlement prisons, category C and D, including the open prisons, that's the prison that is starting to prepare you for release. And then we have the high security cat A. So <clears throat> that's our prison system in the UK, essentially in a nutshell. So how do we as a society know that our prisoners are, prisoners are being treated safely, fairly and humanely? Because if nothing else, that's what we are legally obliged to do with our prisoners. So the independent monitoring boards, they were established back in 1952. Uh, and the role is to monitor, not surprisingly, the treatment received by those who we detain at Her Majesty's or His Majesty's pleasure. And we're there to determine specifically, are they treated safely, fairly, justly, and humanely? But simply put, it's to make sure that what should happen does, and what shouldn't, doesn't. So that is the role of the IMB. So there is a firm statutory basis for the IMB the IMBs, 
So we operate under the, the Prison Act of 1952. Uh, and because we now also work in immigration centers, then there's also relevant legislation in the Immigration and Asylum Act of 1999. And then we're also a signatory of this long-winded United Nations protocol to do with preventing torture and cruel and inhumane or degrading treatment, otherwise known as OPCAT. So the IMB is the UK part of the, what's called the National Preventive Mechanism for OPCAT. So a pretty firm statutory basis for what we do. Uh, we are based in prisons and young offender institutions. So every prison has an IMB board, an IM board. Uh, immigration removal centers, uh, short-term holding facilities at airports, ports, and charter flights returning illegal immigrants. So as and when there are planes flying to Rwanda, there will be IMB members on board those planes. Not a role that I personally care to, to do. So how does the IMB, or how do the IMBs relate to the, the prison service? So we essentially report to the Minister of Justice, as does the prison system, which is uh, Her Majesty's Prison and Probation Service, HMPPS. So we are parallel to, but we are separate from the prison service. So myself as an IMB volunteer, um, you know, I applied for the role. Uh, it's a public service appointment. So I was actually formally appointed as we all were. Uh, by the Secretary of State for Justice. And there's <clears throat> an overarching structure in the UK called the, the IMB Secretariat. They provide the training, they provide guidance, um, they provide um, a range of services to the individual IMBs. But essentially, each IMB is literally independent of anybody else. So you know, our nuclear option in principle is that if we found, for example, that the governor was working arm in arm with an organized crime group, which we decided was not a good idea, we could in principle pick up the phone and talk directly to the minister to raise the flag. Now, that is the nuclear option. That's not what we normally do. Uh, we generally work through and around the, the IMB secretariat, but gives you a flavor of of the independence that we have as, a, um, as an organization. So each IMB is a member, I say has a number of volunteers at Bristol. Uh, it's about 10 of us at the moment. Um, like I say, appointed by the Secretary of Justice and there's about 1,250 of us in the UK covering those various institutions that we've, we've talked about. But before I go into um, the detail of the role, uh, I'll just paint a bit of a picture about HMP Bristol. So HMP Bristol, previously known as Hawfield, uh, dates from 1883. So when I was preparing the slides, I realized it's the 140th anniversary of HMP Bristol. Now, if that doesn't shock you, I don't know what would. So it's originally Victorian, uh, extensive additions, uh, it's located in the middle of the residential area of Hawfield in Bristol. Uh, it's not the most appealing of buildings. Uh, I think this is probably 1960s, this particular block. This is the business hub and the main entrance and reception of the, of the prison. So the facilities at uh, Bristol, so there are five residential wings where the prisoners live, each with a, a large exercise yard. There's one segregation block, which is where prisoners typically who have um, breached the disciplinary rules will be put in isolation. I'll come back to that later. There are four workshops where they can learn skills, carpentry and such like. Two gyms, extremely important in a prison. It's a great way for the prisoners to burn off energy. Um, there's a very new education center, Phoenix Education Center opened in 2020. Purpose built, in principle, a terrific facility at the prison. Now, utilizing it effectively is one of the challenges. And again, I'll come back to that in a while. There's a multi-phase center, and there's a chaplaincy that includes 
Quakers and Muslim and C of E and pagan amongst others. So the prison tries to address most of the population in terms of their religious needs. There's a reception block where prisoners arrive. There's a reception wing where they stay for the first night. Uh, there's a visitor center, which has the most amazing large children's soft play area. It's fantastic. One of the strengths of the prison is a very friendly environment for when families do come and visit. <clears throat> there's also, a, I think, the largest video conference facility in any prison in the UK that's used for court sessions. So rather than having to drag a prison to a court for their hearing, many of the hearings are now done with Zoom effectively. Very popular with the prisons, popular with the courts, popular with the staff, and it's very efficient. It means you're not taking a prisoner out of the prison and then you know, with an escort losing a day and such like. Uh, and then lastly, most recently, there's a new employment hub to help the prisoners get ready for, um, for leaving. But there's essentially no or very limited green space. So it's brick, concrete, metal, and wire. And the accommodation is Spartan, I would say. So uh, this is what a typical wing looks like. This is a Victorian wing. It looks like the kind of thing you would see on porridge, which rather dates me, or, or time more recently is on the TV, but this is your classic three or four landing prison wing. Can be very hot in summer, can be very cold in winter, and it can be very noisy. And my first impression of visiting Bristol was the noise. It was shocking. Doors banging, people shouting. Uh, and it seems quieter now. I may just have got used to it, or it may have been a bad day, but the noise was incredible. So this is a, a typical, typical cell. It's, it's not big. Uh, it's very basic. Uh, pretty much all the cells have a TV these days, uh, receiving certain channels that the prison service decides they can access. It's okay, it's Spartan. But this is a double occupancy cell, not much bigger than a single cell. Two guys may not know each other. This is an improvised screen for the toilet in the cell. If you're locked up 23 hours or 22 hours at a weekend, not a very nice place to be. But it's a Victorian prison, so what else would we expect from our prisoners? And then this is a cell in the segregation block. There are nine cells in seg at Bristol. Prisoners are moved here if they've been violent or excessively disobedient, or sometimes occasionally for their own safety. So it has minimum facilities, little that you can do damage to, in the cell, though amazingly, some prisoners do manage to damage the cells. And, and this, is, this is actually the one area that we have a statutory obligation to talk to the prisoners every time we go into the prison. We go to SEG, we talk individually to each of the prisoners who are in SEG, because that is where most likely torture, be it sensory deprivation or such like will be taking place. So that's why we go to say, not that we're concerned at Bristol that anyone's being tortured, but that that's the principle uh, of visiting the, the segregation block. So some facts about Bristol. Let's say it's a category B local prison. So it's providing accommodation for prisoners that come from the local community so their families can easily go and visit them provides remand accommodation for people from the courts who have been remanded and reception for newly sentenced prisoners as well. The, the operational capacity as defined by the prison service, uh, nominally 620, currently limited to 580. And as of Monday, there are 552 prisoners in the prison. An interesting statistic is at the operation capacity, the overcrowding rate, which is defined as two men in a cell that's designed for one, is, is 50%. So the planned operational capacity of Bristol assumes 
50% of the prisoners are in an overcrowded cell. About 50% of the population in Bristol is on remand. So these are unsentenced prisoners. They've been remanded either because they're viewed as a safety risk to the public or a safety risk to themselves. So because there's a large remand population and we're near a court, then although the capacity of the prison is around about 600, we typically get about two and a half thousand prisoners through the prison every year. So they'll be sentenced to Bristol, they might spend a week or a month in um, HMP Bristol, and then before they moved on to another category B or category C prison. So that in itself brings challenges for the prison staff. I mean, I guess about 200 of the 600 are local prisoners there all the time, but then you have this lot, you know, this churn of other prisoners, you know, just trying to make the best of their time in, in Bristol. And in principle, a, a remand prisoner has certain benefits that, are not, that a sentenced prisoner doesn't have. In principle, you can wear your own clothes. You can choose not to work in the, in the workshops. You can choose not to go to education. And in principle, you can decide not to share a cell with a sentenced prisoner. That's your right. Now, whether that's doable, is another question, but that's the goal. And as you can imagine, as the prison becomes more overcrowded, that becomes a bigger challenge to achieve. But that's just one of the challenges facing the, the management team. I was thinking about putting the next point up as a blank and asking you what the answer to this question is, but I thought, actually, I'll just tell you. The kitchen staff feed each prisoner for the whole day including snacks for £2.80. That is less than the price or the, less than the cost of school dinner in a primary school. And these are big strapping prisoners that do a lot of exercise. So it's amazing what these cooks can do. Many of them are ex-military chefs. They're used to feeding lots of big strapping men. I'm sure they get more than £2.80 a day to do so. And this is one of the touch points. So food, as you can imagine in a prison, when there's not much else to enjoy, the quality of the food is a big issue. When it goes well, it's great. When it goes badly, it's a disaster. So food is often something we keep an eye on. So when we're visiting the prison, we'll often go at lunchtime and we'll go and taste the food, talk to prisoners, what do they think about the food today, blah, blah, blah. That's part of what we do. And then another shocking takeaway for the average prisoner in Bristol, it is their seventh custodial sentence. Seventh custodial sentence. And that's the average. So some of these guys, it's probably their 20th because some of them, it's their one and only sentence and then they're never coming back. And that for me is, is, is one of my key takeaways, is for some people in our society, this is their life. They're outside, they commit a crime, they come back in. They're outside, commit a crime, they come back in. Why? What is it about our society that means we have this number of people that think that this is normal? I don't know. But whatever it is, a prison is not a holiday camp, whatever the Sun and Daily Mail would like to tell you. So typical day for a prisoner, uh, 0745, unlock, breakfast and domestics, which means getting a shower, washing your clothes. Uh, and then 8.30, that's when you will be escorted to the activities that you have signed up for. Might be education, might be working in a workshop, might be your day for exercise, medical care and such like. If you choose not to be doing an activity, then you will go back to your cell and you'll be locked up the rest of the morning. That is your choice. So there is uh, a program for uh, offering incentives to prisoners. So if prisoners are incentivized to do activities, go to education, go to work, they get paid a certain amount of money for each session they go to, that goes towards their canteens and it's called they can spend that money. There's a lot of emphasis 
on encouraging prisoners to do the activities, but some choose not to. That's their choice. So by 11 o'clock, back in your cell, lunch around about 11.30, 12 o'clock locked up for the next two hours. The prison is largely dead for those two hours. It's the staff lunch break. They have meetings and such like. So if you visit Bristol Prison between 12 and 2, it's very quiet because everybody's in their cell. And then again, between two and four, more activities, workshop, education, and, and such like. Supper will be at four o'clock, and then you're locked up at five until 7.45 in the morning. That is a typical weekday when there's a normal staffing level. Uh, at weekends, there are fewer staff, fewer activities. You spend a lot of time at weekends locked up in your cell. And this is one of the current issues that is exercising the Ministry of Justice and the prison service is, doesn't feel like a sensible way of treating people to lock them up for a weekend. But if you haven't got the staff, look at all the facilities, that's what you're gonna get. Not surprisingly, the, the activities are key to rehabilitation and resettlement back into society. If you can't read and write, and quite a few of the prisoners can't read and write. Often you'll be asked to read a, a letter for a prisoner or you'll be asked to fill out a complaint form for a prisoner because they can't write. So you'll sit down, they'll dictate and then off you go. So education is clearly critical to getting back into society, being trained you know, to an, some NVQ level in carpentry or decoration clearly up advantageous thing to do. So the activities and access to the activities is a critical part of rehabilitation and resettlement. But most of those things requires an escort for a group of prisoners around the prison. You have to get from A to B, you have to get to the Phoenix education block, you need a prison officer on each floor in the education box block such that the education staff safe. So if you don't have enough staff on, on a given day, then you cannot provide an escort to education or the workshops. So nothing happens. The prisoners are locked up and they've lost another little bit of their rehabilitation. So staffing levels you know, are critical. It doesn't matter what facilities you have, if you haven't got staff to move the prisoners around, you're buggered. Simple as that. And that's a big issue, which we'll come back to. So that was a picture of, of Bristol. Come back to the IMB. So what do we do? We monitor. So how do you monitor? In fact, what is monitoring? It's not inspection. There is a inspection service called Her Majesty's Inspection of Prisons, HMIP. Their job is inspection. And the IMB views monitoring and inspection as quite different things. Inspection is once every one or two years you turn up, see what's changed, see what's wrong, make recommendations, off you go again. The idea of monitoring is that we're in the prison once or twice a week. We know how the prison works. We can start to see things going wrong. We can talk to the governor and we can nudge and monitor what's happening on a much more real-time basis. So rather than waiting for a once a year inspection, the idea of monitoring is we're there on the ground, keeping an eye on things and raising things that we see are relevant. And we have four questions that we have to answer. So how safe is the prison? And that literally means, do the prisoners feel safe? Do they feel vulnerable to being bullied or beaten up by the staff, bullied or beaten up by their fellow prisoners? It's as simple as that. And they should feel safe. No prisoner should feel unsafe. And then we come to how well is their health and well-being looked after? And the simple rule of thumb here is outside the prison in Hallfield, if you can get to see your GP in two days, the prisoners ought to be able to get to see the GP in two days. If you can see a dentist in a week outside, 
the prisoners ought to be able to see a dentist in a week outside because the punishment is deprivation of liberty. It's not poor health care or poor food. It's just solely deprivation of liberty. So we need to look after them in terms of their health. And that really also relates to the next one, fairly inhumanely. This is literally, is what happened to this prisoner today. Was that fair? Were they treated properly? Were they discriminated against? I mean, they shouldn't be discriminated against. You know, and there are, I forget what the term is, seven characteristics where you can be discriminated against. So that can be age, gender, race, religion, physical disability, and two more I can't remember, so I've failed that test. Prisoners should not be discriminated against. And again, we need to be watching and seeing whether that's the case. And, you know, and that can be as simple as if a prisoner in a wheelchair, of which there are quite a few in Bristol, if they want to go and earn some money in a workshop, well, they ought to be able to go and work in a workshop. But actually in Bristol, it's really quite hard because it's a Victorian prison. It's not designed for wheelchair access. So actually, we don't score very highly on that point. But if you want to go to an appropriate religious service, which is an important thing for many people, then actually Bristol is really well served for that. So that's what we mean by fairly and humanely. And then lastly, we come to probably the most important thing, how well are prisoners progressing towards you know, successful resettlement, rehabilitation back into society? So those are the four things we go looking for. How do we find out what's actually happening on the ground? So we go talking to the prisoners. So we have the right to go anywhere in a prison and to speak confidentially out of hearing of any prison officer with any prisoner. So we have a set of keys that we can use to go into pretty much any part of the prison, though not into the individual prisoner cells. In practice, when you go on a wing, you're very sensible. If you just go in the office and say, I'm on the wing, I'm gonna go and see so-and-so, is that okay? Because some of the prisoners, for example, you'll see on the door of their cell, it'll say a four man unlock. And that means you can't unlock the cell with less than four officers waiting to control the prisoner. So I don't choose to go into a cell that requires normally a four man unlock. So then you'll talk to the prisoner through the door, through the hatch or whatever. But the principle is, as an IMB member, we can go anywhere in a prison. We can talk to anybody confidentially. We can see any document. In fact, we could look up a prisoner's record if we chose to. So we have fantastic access and, and that's a very good thing. So we have two formal kinds of visits. Uh, there's the Rotary, which is our regular weekly visit. Uh, and like I say, the, the one thing that we have to do is go and speak to every prisoner on segregation, see that they're okay, seeing they've been well looked after, any complaints, any concerns. So you go and do that. And then when you've done that, then we decide which other parts of the prison we'll go to. So we might go to two of the residential wings, go to a couple of workshops, go to the kitchen, and just generally go and talk to prisoners, talk to staff. It's like any kind of audit job. You go in with a bit of a broad plan, you end up following your nose to see what's going on. You might hear something, a prisoner might say something to you. You look in the observation book in the wing, so every wing keeps an observation book of events that have happened which are unusual, it might be a drug find or such like. So look at that. And then prisoners who need particular care, then there's a care plan for each of those prisoners. It's called an ACT, A-double-C-T, I forget what it stands for. So that care plan, for example, might be that this prisoner, Mr. Smith, should have a formal conversation and observation four times an hour, 24 seven, in which case in his file, there should be a log for the day of all the conversations that have taken place. And so we'll generally look at some of those forms to make sure that what should be happening is happening. 
as you can imagine, that's a pretty intensive care program for a business. On a good day, Bristol will have maybe 10 acts open for 500 prisoners. On a bad day, it will be 50. And that's a lot of energy work required to look after those 50 prisoners. So that's a Rotary visit. Um, we also do an applications visit, as we call it. And any prisoner can send a complaint to the IMB. There's a letterbox on every wing. So once a week, one of us goes around, get to the letterboxes, read the applications, understand what the issue is, try and decide what to do about it. And then we'll take some action, probably. And then we'll go back and talk to the prisoner and say, well, based on this, we think that we can help you with this. We can't help you with that. In practice, we always encourage the prisoners to first go and use the prison complaint system. You know, we're not there to replace the complaint system. In fact, in principle, we're there to monitor that the complaint system works. But in reality, we do get complaints. Sometimes we say, actually, you're better off filing a formal complaint because then the prison knows what's going on. Sometimes it's just quicker and more effective for us to sort the thing out there and then go and find the answer to the question and go back and tell the prisoner and we're done and dusted. Not really what you should be doing, but it's quite hard not to when you're in that situation. We also attend disciplinary reviews, um, adjudications. So for example, if a prisoner is sent to segregation, then I think within the first 48 hours, they need a hearing with a, with a, with a duty governor to discuss why they were sent to segregation, what the offense was and, and such like. So it's like a mini, a mini court. We can attend any of those adjudications so that we can be sure they're being done properly. And I must say that you know, the adjudications I've attended have been remarkably, kindly, thoughtfully well done. We attend prisoners council once a month, uh, specialist meetings of healthcare. If there is a death in custody, then we'll follow up with the prison staff and the circumstances. If the prisoner who has died, and is typically suicide, uh, is somebody that we have spoken to, then we might be asked by the, um, uh, what do you call it when you have a coroner, thank you. <laughs> we might be asked by the coroner to attend the inquest and present our perspective. If there's a serious incident, which might be a hostage taking, or it might be, uh, multiple prisoners jumping onto the nets. Uh, if the prison opens the control room, then the prisoner will ring the duty, the Rotary volunteer, and one of us will go to the control room. Maybe two of us will turn up, one in the control room, one down on the wing, again, to monitor what's happening. Because ultimately, if there is a significant event in a prison, you've got the prisoners on one hand, the prison staff on the others, and it's a he said, she said thing and the IMB are in fact the only independent people to have a view of what happened so actually we fulfill a useful purpose in fact on behalf of the staff as much as the prisoners as being an independent view on whatever the serious event was so as an IMB volunteer we spend about one day every two or three weeks in prison when you first start you're on probation you're following other more experienced members around it's like once a week so it can be, it is a big commitment, particularly at the beginning. Uh, still a reasonable commitment now. So what value do we bring? Well, almost the first bullet is the most important thing. You go on a wing and sometimes a prisoner just wants to talk about his family, about the weather, about the football. And we've got time to do that. Friendly face, non-judgmental quite happy to have a chat with the prisoner. And you might be the only conversation they have that week that's informal. So the staff, the prisoners know we're independent of the prison. And if you've been around a few prisons, which these guys have, you know, then they'll be familiar with IMBs at other prisons. So people generally know who we are. One of the good things, one of the very good things is we have extremely good access to the governor. In fact, in many cases, it's better than the staff have because there's a hierarchy in a prison.
But if we find a significant issue, you can go and talk and go and find the governor immediately and tell them. And then they will pay attention to that. So even you know, the staff know that. So sometimes it's the staff that say, we've got a problem on the wing of X, Y, Z. Can you go and tell the governor? Because we've tried doing it through the normal route and it doesn't work. So we can sometimes unblock a logjam, resolve the communication issue. And like many organizations, many problems are simply miscommunication or something that's not been communicated in a timely manner. So that's the kind of thing. You know, we can go and talk to healthcare. A prisoner said, I need an appointment and I've failed to get an appointment. I haven't had one for two weeks. Well, we can go along to healthcare, look in there, ask to see their records. And often they'll say, the staff will say, okay, well, yeah, it's got a GP appointment in two days time. But the prisoner didn't know that. <laughs> so you go back, tell the prisoner, and it's sorted. And if it wasn't us doing that, I'm not quite sure sometimes just how that process is going to work. We also know how the prison works. We're familiar with common issues, problems, so we can do a bit of advice as well to them, what they might expect. So if you file a complaint in the prison system, it's five working days to get an answer. If it's about a member of staff, it's 10 working days. So you can help set expectations and avoid frustrations. But as I say, we're not there to replace the prison complaint system. We're there to monitor. And for people like me, we're not there to manage. We're not there to problem solve. We're not there to critique the management structure. We are simply there to monitor. And for most of us that do this with a professional background, that's really quite hard because we're kind of like professional problem solvers. And this time around, all we're doing is saying it's working well, it's not. So that's a, that's a frustration. So this, this is how we get the evidence that we need to write opinions about whether the prison is fair, safe, humane. It's the conversations that we have with the prisoners and staff, it's the applications that we handle. That's how we gather the evidence. Because the one thing we cannot do is write you know, unsubstantiated hearsay based reports. That's, if nothing else, is grossly unfair to the prison staff. So how do we communicate our findings? Um, we do, the Rotary Aid person writes a Rotary Aid report once a week, capturing all of the information that we've gathered, copied to the governor, and often there'll be questions to the governor and the governor will respond in a couple of days. Uh, the governor attends our monthly IMB meetings, so we can ask them questions, we can get an update on things, regular meetings with the governor in various contexts. And then the big thing is once a year, we write an annual report to the Ministry of Justice describing how the prison has run in the last year. These reports are available on the IMB website. You can go and look at them right now. Uh, and also the minister's responses to each report are also there on the website. So actually it's a very public process. And that's the idea that, you know, society and prisoners' families can see what the IMB in the prison are seeing and reporting. So to get back to the question, are they safe? Are they humane? So if you look at Bristol first, I think in any organization, the, the culture is absolutely key. I mean, we've all worked in different organizations. If it's a poor culture, then you're doomed. And when you walk into Bristol the first time, there's a board there that says, our values are kindness, integrity, teamwork, and engagement. And when I first walked into the prison, my immediate thought was, ah, here he is, the usual corporate claptrap. Heard it all before. I've even written it myself before, probably. But actually, at Bristol, it's true. It's led from the top by the governor and the senior management team. And most of the staff believe and aspire to work like this. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that all the staff behave like this, and I have evidence that they don't in some few cases, but generally, this is what the staff believe and they try and live by. 
as well, the, the facilities in principle offer what's required for effective rehabilitation and progression, despite much the state being Victorian. So there's a lot going for the prisoners in Bristol, but there are some major challenges. So resourcing is a huge challenge, absolutely huge. There's been heavy attrition in the last five, 10 years, back in 2012, cost saving, let's have a voluntary uh, redundancy, early retirement scheme. There was a lot of experienced prison officers walked out of the prison with a pay check, because at the time that's what was wanted. More recently, one of the benefits of Brexit is that the border force needs to be much bigger than it used to be. You can transfer from the prison service the border force very easily, internal transfer, transfer, at least as good pay, much easier conditions. Oof. A lot of staff disappeared off to the border force, plus other government agencies. So a lot of recruitment going on, but that's a lot of training required, which takes people offline still before they're deployed. Prison service recognizes that. So there are staff at Bristol that are on detached duty from other prisons to provide additional headcount. But there are a lot of new staff and they're young. You can become a prison officer now at 18. You're expected to deal, in some cases, with quite hardened criminals. I'm not sure that an 18 year old has got sufficient work life experience, regardless of all the training you can give them, and they get a lot, that they can really effectively work in that situation. I mean, there are a lot of good young people going into the prison service, but I worry about that aspect. And then lastly, the prison population is changing and it's providing or forcing a much more intensive workload. So not only are there not enough staff, the amount of work they're having to do is a lot harder, a lot more time consuming. So mental health, a big issue. The courts now regard prisons as a safe place for people with mental health issues. So you're getting prisoners remanded for mental health issues. The prisons are not designed for mental health patients. They require a lot more care and attention, which detracts, distracts from doing all the other things that the other prisoners should be getting in terms of activities. If you have to be doing a 24 seven bed watch on a mental health prisoner, you can't escort 15 prisoners to education. That's the problem. So you've got limited resource. You've got quite a challenging prison population, self-harm, suicides and such like. So that is a big issue when it comes to rehabilitation. The prison, they're overcrowded. We've already seen that. There is some new capacity coming on stream, but it's not coming along quickly enough. It makes it very hard to manage the prison population. If you've got two gangs in Bristol with members in Bristol prison, you can't have them on the same wing. You just can't, it's just too dangerous. So you've then got to juggle people around the wings. It's like the game with the empty square and a block of nine. You've got to move it around. You can do that when you've got the empty block. If you haven't got an empty block, <laughs> well, you can't move people around. So overcrowding is a big issue. There's a big illicit economy in most prisons, and by which I mean there's drugs available. This chap over here is doing his PhD on drug use in Bristol prison, he knows. Drug called spice, big problem. Obviously there's not meant to be any drugs in a prison. It's a continual battle to keep drugs out. Drones flying up to your cell window, people throwing, tennis balls full of drugs over the wall from the adjacent school playground. So it's a perpetual battle keeping drugs out of prison because drugs in prison, you've got behavior issues, you've got debt. Debt in a prison means violence. The two go hand in hand. So you run the risk of all these factors, rising level of violence, prisoner on prisoner, prisoner on staff and self-harm. Self-harm is a big issue. That's one of the things personally I find very hard to cope with. I don't like looking at self-harm. I don't understand it. So 
Then there have been recent changes to prison policy. Sentencing guidelines have been toughened up. That's the main reason the prison population is forecast to increase. But longer sentences mean a bigger prison population. It's the maths. 10% longer sentence, 10% bigger prison population. You know, you'd think even an old Etonian could work that out. What's likely to happen is early release of prisoners. So how ironic is that? You toughen up your sentencing and you have to release prisoners probably in a less controlled manner than you would normally do. Last year, 2022, the Secretary of State for Justice, Mr. Dominic Raab, introduced a statutory instrument that significantly challenged the independence of the parole boards. And in fact, the Secretary of Justice can overrule probation officers and prison staff and any other expert can now no longer make a recommendation specifically about saying, I think this prisoner is ready for release. They can't say that. They can describe their behavior. They cannot make a recommendation anymore. They're not allowed to. Though, as it happens, as of, I think, three weeks ago, the High Court has thrown out that particular point which is good news. And then there are plans to make the parole board release test harder. So all of which means that prisoners end up bouncing back up from an open prison to a cat C to a cat B because the chances of them being paroled are either much harder or non-existent. So you end up bouncing prisoners back from where they should be into an overcrowded category B prison. Seems to me that this is decisions <laughs> taken to knowingly make the situation worse. It's peculiar. Then we come to the scandal of the IPP prisoners. And this is imprisonment for public protection, introduced in 2005 by David Blunkett, abolished in 2012, because it was recognized this was a grossly unfair and unjust punishment. And basically, it's detention of prisoners who were deemed to be a significant risk to the public should not be released until they were determined to be no longer a risk. So they serve a minimum tariff and then are only released if the parole board thinks that the test of no danger is met. They can be recalled on license when they have been released, in which case they have to go back to the parole board again. So although this, was, this particular form of, of sentence was abolished in 2012, as of the end of last year, there were close on 3,000 prisoners on IPP sentences, of which about 1,500 were unreleased. And of the unreleased prisoners, all bar 35 had passed their tariff. So in any normal sentence, they would have been released by now, but they're held until the parole board says they can be released. The parole board is less able now to release them because of that statutory instrument. The IMB nationally now is monitoring the suicides of IPP prisoners who are in, in despair about ever being released. And it's not just when they're going to be released, they do not know what they have to do to be released. It's a shocking, shocking sentence. So we have the House of Parliament, a legislature that is there to challenge our executive. Intelligent people on the Justice Committee wrote a very well thought out report on the IPP situation in 2022, 
one of the main recommendations was just saying, okay, we need to resentence all of these IPP prisoners, which we abolished the legislation 20 years, 10 years ago, and it was rejected out of hand by the Secretary of State. Just like, no, you've done all the work, you're wrong. So we see IPP prisoners killing themselves because of this. So there is some good news. One of the challenges about releasing prisoners, if you release a prisoner on a Friday with a rail warrant to get home, might be 300 miles away, 20 quid in their pocket. They need to go and find a council, their council where they're gonna, who's gonna house them. If they get delayed, the council building will be shut for a whole weekend. They have nowhere to go. They are homeless. Quite a few prisoners end up back in prison that weekend because of this issue. So there is now a new bill that's gone through where governor now has discretion to release a prisoner who's due out on a Friday, on a Wednesday or Thursday beforehand. Doesn't sound like much, but actually that's potentially a huge game changer for some of these prisoners. And talking of homelessness, prisoners should not be released without having 28 days of accommodation already arranged, either with their family or by their council. This is a goal that is often not met, but fantastically in the last month at Bristol, it's like 85% of prisoners have been released with 28 days of accommodation. Again, it's avoiding the homelessness being a reason for people reoffending to get back in somewhere they feel safe. And then lastly, the employment initiatives for ex-convicts are growing. I know I'm shooting over time, we've done in two minutes. Timpsons have been doing this a long time. There are now people like Tesco's and Greg's who are now specifically employing ex-convicts. That has to be a fantastic way of breaking the seven sentences that people have been through. So it is possible to make good decisions if we put our minds to it. So the last slide, are our prisons safe and humane? Well, it's what the staff strive for. But right now, there are significant challenges and in reality, they're getting worse. So I'm not sure. Thank you very much. Well, how much information, how many different facets to consider, and, and what an impassioned speech and talk. Fantastic. Uh, I'm sure there will be lots of questions. Uh, I'm sure online as well. We'll start in the room. We're very, you've, you've already got a volunteer for the IMB. Oh, really? That's good. So that's excellent. So, that, well, that, well, well, congratulations, Andreas. <laughs> I didn't say it was me, but uh, there's a volunteer already waiting. So I think given all of the issues and all the information you've provided, uh, would you be happy for these slides to be made available to people or is that is that an issue? No, I think that's, as, as well, you know, they, it comes, I'll, I'll, I'll need to add a slide that says it's my personal opinion. Yeah, just to be right. absolutely clear about that. But I think it would so. be very useful because there's so many different facets as yeah. part of that. That's great. Okay, well, we'll start with questions in the room. I'm going to go around with the microphone. So please raise your hand and I shall pick you out. Gentleman at the back. Excellent. Now, just for the audience online, if you speak directly into it. Uh, Joe, thank you. Uh, that was um, fascinating. Uh, shocking in equal uh, proportions and something I think probably a lot more people need to hear and know. Um, my question really is, um, I I've been wondering how representative of the national demographic the IMBs are. Oh, well, it's um, so of, of the 10 of us, um, I think um, we are six women, four men. Um, 
mixture of academics, professionals, um, a florist, uh, student. So it's it's a broader demographic than Brilsey, <laughs> but it's clearly not representative, for example, of the prison population. Uh, and they're obviously they're, the goal is to to make the two match better. Um, but it's a challenge to make it accessible and welcoming enough and unthreatening enough for more people of a different demographic to, to join, I think. But you know, there's a willingness there to make it happen. It's just quite mm. yeah, tricky. Okay. I've got a question. Do different countries have different criteria for incarceration, you looked at figures for Germany. You looked yeah, at so UK. I, um, I'm, I'm absolutely not uh, an academic in this area. So, but you know, clearly there is a, a huge spectrum of approaches to. You know, I think Denmark in Europe is is the one that's least inclined to imprison. But I, I know that in in the Netherlands they've been changing their approach. They've been closing prisons hmm. because they don't need to have as many. So, yeah, I think. And I think that's what's where this whole topic is is huge. Yeah. Um, yeah, especially, so, when you, especially when you've got America with two million people in prisons. Yeah, so yeah. basically the equivalent of four Bristols. Yeah. So you know, people incarcerated. So okay. Another question. Thank you so much. Um, I just wondered if you felt there's additional risks with privatization of the prison system and if we can find solutions, um, you know, keeping them national. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, um, I personally think that you know, the, <clears throat> the private sector has a place where there's a market. I don't think there's a market in the prison system. Is my opinion. Okay, that was a quick answer. I didn't have time to, to actually <laughs> adjust the online audience for this, but that's perfect. Ian, you've got another question. Thank you, Andreas. I'll, oh, this will be a long question. You know this will be. Um, it's actually, I and mean, maybe it's, 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 you don't know the answer to this, but I, I'm fascinated by the origins of the IMB. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a long history of prison reform in, in the country, and there's still lots of prison reform uh, uh, groups. Um, do you know, can you give us any insight into what 52, that sounds like, it, it, was it part of a particular campaign? or? or well, so, I, yeah, so I think 52 was the Prison Act at that time. And so I think that was the first time that there was a statutory body like this. Obviously, before that, you know, there have been prison visitors for, for hundreds of years, but I don't think they were statutory. So I think I think that's the difference. But again, I'm not being an academic in this area. I don't know for sure, but that's my my understanding. And there'd be no further changes to that statutory basis since '52. Beyond you said about the uh, asylum. Yeah. So there's the, yeah, so the immigration thing, and then the the, the UN Charter in. Or the signing up to the UN Charter in '99. It's kind of impressive that they've not tried to change the terms of that, perhaps. Yeah. So, well, I, I think um, if you if you look at some of the minister's responses to our thoughtfully written reports, then you may think actually that they're quite happy with jogging along. Okay, so we have uh, thank you, Joe. Actually, uh, two, hopefully, relatively quick questions. Um, what might surprise you is when I say, as somebody who was released from prison on a Friday, uh, I was a civil prisoner, not a criminal prisoner. Uh, it's a long story. Um, I absolutely see your comments about, um, especially when people have long distance travel, but I'm curious to your experience then for Bristol, because it's supposed to be for local prisons. Sure. Um, so that's the, that's number one. Yeah. And then the second is uh, to follow on from Ian's comment. Um, you know, there are a lot of organisations out there for the welfare of prisoners. Do, do um, members of the IMB interact with people like NACRO or these other organisations that deal with rehabilitation of offenders? And, and yeah, so, so certainly in... In my experience at Bristol, 
then there are some of those charities that operate within Bristol you know, for the resettlement. Um, and we kind of liaise with them. Um, we don't like, formally cooperate with them because we've got a role to do. But you know, if, if there's a prisoner who's concerned about resettlement, then one of the things you might do is go and talk to the, that charity and see what we can do to help or resolve an issue. But there's no formal cooperation because we've got quite a well-defined enough on our plate role to do that. Um, uh, with regards to your first question, then, uh, then yes, it's meant to be a local prison, but you can't always manage that, depending on what space is available. So you do occasionally have prisoners when they are at least traveling much further than you would expect, given that it's a local prison, just because that's the practicality of the system. Okay, and I think there was a gentleman here at the back. Describe the uh, difference between the inspectors of prison and your role as a monitor. Yeah. One sometimes hears on the news about a prison which has failed dismally after their inspection. What's your view of the monitoring in such a prison? So interestingly, Bristol failed its inspection three years ago, four years ago now. So it was put into special measures uh, and by HMIP. Uh, and there was a new governor brought in. So our IMB was monitoring all the way through that process. And as it happens, in fact, HMIP is back in Bristol this week to follow up on the special measures from, from three years ago. So for example, HMIP is in this week. They asked to see members of the IMB on Monday to get their opinion about the prison today and, and such like. So we tend to not be invited so the minister of justice or a representative can be in bristol we might find out we're seldom invited so sometimes you know, we're like the the awkward uncle <laughs> we're kind of meant to be at the party but like people aren't sure about us so um yeah it's a, it's a it's peculiar slightly peculiar i mean it's my only experience of this kind of thing so on the one hand, it feels like we're a valued part of the system. And on the other hand, occasionally, it feels like we're ignored. So. Okay, we've got uh, a few questions in the chat room. I'm gonna read them out. Uh, whilst I'm doing that, if anybody on online on Zoom wants to unmute and ask a question directly uh, and show the video, please feel free to do that. Um, this is a question for Marcus. Can you be selective of your feedback to governors or are you obliged to report all your findings? So we, we, we sensibly want to report the things that concern us about the way the prison's running. And you know, that's the goal is to monitor, to make sure that what should happen does and what shouldn't doesn't. So there's, there's no incentive on our part not to report the facts. And, you know, if so, we report the good things and we report the things that worry us but you know i can't think of any occasion when we've held something back because i'm not sure why why would you you know because the governor wants to run a safe and humane prison you know they're not there to cause pain and anguish to prisoners they want to know what's going wrong so we try and help them if that answers the question yeah okay great uh then paul is asking a question what surprised you the most when you started in the imb the seven you know the seven <laughs> custodial sentences being the average because i thought you know that half the idea was rehabilitation and that just says it's not working yeah I, it would be interesting to understand how many of those are due to the fact that uh, people, uh, prisoners were released on Fridays. I, I can't give you the stats. I just know anecdotally that's a problem. And it's a big enough problem, clearly, for the law to have been changed to allow prisoners to uh, not be released on a Friday. So there are actually some prisoners who prefer to be in prison than to be homeless. So if we fix the homeless problem, We'd lose a load of prisoners yeah. because they wouldn't come back. You know, you, we need a, to use a dreadful word, and holistic approach to this. This is a societal problem with inequality. 
it's not in isolation of the rest of life. Okay, there's another question. How much emphasis is placed on reintegration into the community rather than uh, discipline and punishment? So the punishment is deprivation of liberty. It's not being disciplined in prison. I mean, you'll get disciplined if you are ill-disciplined. But if you're in prison and you behave by the rules, you're treated with respect, you get fed properly, you get educated and trained with the goal of breaking the cycle. So that is the aim of the prisoners. Now, some prisoners don't respond well to that. Some prisoners seem to have no boundaries. They don't know when to stop and they need different help. But for many prisoners, it's quite basic what they need. You need to read and write. You need to use to know how to use a smartphone these days. Some of the prisoners have been there long enough. They come out. They can't access services because they haven't got a smartphone because they can't get a contract. And if they had a smartphone, they wouldn't know what the hell to do with it. You know, it's a lot of things that need sensible help. Mm. Because if you if you halved the reoffending, you would halve the prison population you'd halve the number of offences committed in the UK. You know, it's about re-offending. That's my conclusion. Yeah. Everything else is symptomatic. If you can fix the re-offending, you fix most of the problems. But in order to, to fix the re-offending, you need to have an infrastructure in place that yeah. uh, supports people when they've yeah. left prison. It's, 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 you know, there's a lot of things you have to do right. But I mean, it's like you know, any of the public services. You know, you need to know what you're trying to do. You need a sensible plan, and then you have to resource it and do it. Yeah. I mean, there have been 10 Secretary of States for Justice in the last 10 years. It's like ridiculous. Yeah. It's, they don't, they're not there long enough to own their mistakes. Because most of us in a job, we take a decision with the expectation we live with the results of that decision. So we think very carefully before we take decisions. Yeah, there's another question here actually relating to that. What is the selection process for IMBs by the minister? Is there any risk of political interference in who is appointed? Um, I mean, a fair question. No, it's not something that's ever occurred to us, occurred to me. Uh, I mean, the goal is to match the population broadly of who's in prison and as to who the IMB members are. You could be you can be rejected if you've got um so if I had a family member that worked in the prison, I couldn't be an IMB member there. If I have a family member who's in prison anywhere, I can't be an IMB member. But those are you know, the main kind of things. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a reasonably rigorous process, but I don't think it's abused by the Ministry of Justice. Okay, and we've got one more question online and then we can go back into the room. Uh, and that is, Understand the IMB can write annual reports to the minister, which provides transparency and can improve things somewhat through a direct and immediate liaison with the governor. But are there, are there teeth to make change there a significant problem, presumably only the threat of legal challenge ultimately? So I think that's putting you know, the finger on the main source of frustration from members of the IMB is, you know, we're not enabled to make change because that's not that's specifically not our job and that is the most frustrating thing so that is one of the roles of the you know the national secretariat is pooling feedback from the various imbs around the uk and then taking a certain number of messages to government to charities and such like to try and influence well and to mps but it's you know it's you know we we don't have a statutory authority to make change we are simply there to, to monitor and communicate in like forums like this so that more people know what's going on. In fact, you need to understand what is being done in your name to these people. That's essentially what it boils down to. They're in prison because we as society choose to imprison them. That's why you need to worry about safety and humanity, apart from other practical issues like you don't want prisoners being released who aren't actually ready for release, for example. 
So you mentioned Bristol is a category B prison. Yes, category so, B local, yeah. So remind us what that means. So um, that is the level of security one down from the most dangerous prisoners. But I would say it's, you know, there's never been an IMB member injured or attacked since 52. You know, it's, although it's a prison full of prisoners, it's actually not dangerous for us. Now, the staff sometimes get attacked by the prisoners, but we don't. Okay, I think we've got room for a couple more questions. There's a gentleman at the front. Yeah, I'm interested in the um, requirement for the 28-day accommodation on release. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Is there any um, requirements about what that accommodation needs to be? Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, broadly just described as, you know, as a safe. Um, so, you know, it's like it might be in a hostel, but basically it's, it's to, so somewhere safe and dry with a bed uh, that avoids the prisoner being on the streets. It's as basic as that. And that if, falls generally, if, if it's not the family, it will fall to the local council. So it's Bristol Council's job to house homeless people amongst all the other people they have to house. And, and it, it's not, mate, you said it's, there's an 85%. Um, yeah. And what happens when it's not? Then it's they're homeless. Out. They are released from prison, homeless. And why might that be? The, like, why, would, why would that not be met? What's happening? Because, because there aren't enough places in hostels to meet all the needs that Bristol Council, for example, has to fulfil. So there are, you know, there's a council house waiting list. There are, I guess, immigrants that needed housing. There's quite a long list of people that require housing. So Bristol, you know, councils don't have enough money to do it all. So it's quite remarkable that Bristol Council, in this particular case, have got to where they've got to. Okay. So I think, oh, there's a lady here, and then I think maybe we make this the, the last question. To this, what you've just said now, surely they have probation officers. Yes. Surely, yes. surely they have probation officers. Yeah. So would the probation officer not be aware that yes. they're now being so, out on the street? So, so absolutely. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll say it again, the, the staff know what they need to do. They know what they have to do within the resources that are practically available. You, you can't keep a prisoner in prison after their release date because they've got nowhere to go. I mean, that would be even more cruel. So the alternative is they leave and they're homeless. So maybe go and stay with a mate. They clearly can't go and stay with family because otherwise they'd have done that anyway. Um, so yeah, so it's not at all comfortable for the prison staff to knowingly release a prisoner to be homeless, but what else can they do given the resources that they have? So there was one last question from a on the screen. I noticed it came up. Okay, do you want to answer directly? Mr. Marcus Meston, and I need to declare a conflict of interest here because Marcus and I used to work together, but I'll still answer his question. So uh, paraphrasing it, it was, um, you know, surely criminals are, are masters of manipulation. So essentially, how can you? trust them to tell you the truth. So the short answer is you have to take the prisoners at face value. You can't sit there and think, okay, you're a master criminal, you're lying to me, or you've committed a horrible offense, I'm not gonna waste my time on you. You have to take it, the, the, that particular situation, you take at face value, if they say they've got a problem with, with healthcare, you try and resolve it. Now, if you go to healthcare and they say, well, okay, Mr. Smith has failed to turn up for his last five appointments, and that's why he hasn't got one today, then you know that you've got Mr. Smith as being just awkward and wasting your time. But at least you've gone and found out what the facts are. So that's what you have to do, is take everything at face value that the prisoners tell you until proven otherwise. Because otherwise, it's the road to hell in this situation. Okay, uh, Joe, thank you very much. We've just scratched the surface, really, and there's so much more to talk about. I think uh, you mentioned Rwanda, and trips, yeah. but obviously that's a slightly different issue, and I'm sure we could have talked for half an hour about the latest barge fiasco scenario that's sort of 
engulfing us as an alternative to Rwanda, but uh, that's for another time. So um, this has been a fantastic evening, really informative, really impassioned uh, talk about uh, life in prisons and, and how humane and safe they are. So please put your hands together for Joe Wilson. The, the thank yous are coming in online as well. Uh, just before we close, uh, let me just talk about a couple of other things that are coming up in the World Affairs series before you go. Uh, this Friday, we have a talk by the senior economist at the OECD, uh, Eliza Lanzi. She's going to give a talk about the global challenges of uh, envi the env environmental challenges in 2050. So she'll be tracing the environmental challenges in terms of pollution between now and 2050. That's this Friday. The following Friday, the World in 2050 series continues. And we've got a uh, consultant called David Baum uh, from Roland Berger so coming to us live from Frankfurt. And he's going to be talking about what technology and innovation will look like in 2050. And then the final talk in the 2050 series is on the 4th of August when we have Professor John Lennox from the University of uh, Oxford to talk to us about uh, the impact of artificial intelligence and what it means for humanity in 2050. So if you're interested in the World in 2050 series and, and what the mega trends are over the next 27 years or so, please join us in the next three Fridays. In the meantime, thank you to Joe once again for an excellent talk, and I wish you all a very safe journey home. Good night, everybody.